Motive. It's a concept that legal talking heads love to talk about in some cases, but not others. Today, I wanna to take a deep dive and tell you three things you need to understand about motive so that you'll understand exactly what these legal heads are talking about, and you'll understand when it's relevant, when it's not, and how it works. Stay tuned. The first thing you need to understand about motive is this. There's really two parts to any criminal action. There is a criminal act, which is called an actus reus, and there is a criminal intent, which is called a mens rea. Really, when we're talking about intent, we're talking about the mens rea. In mens rea, think of it as a sliding scale. And up here, you have purpose. You intend, when you undertake a certain act, to have a certain result. And then down at the very bottom, you're going to have negligence, which is carelessness. You're not necessarily caring what the result is, but you do something that you don't show any care and a bad thing ends up happening. So at the highest end, you have purpose again, which is essentially premeditation, where somebody thinks about something and they actually intend for their act to have a certain bad result. Purpose is a lot different than say, heat of passion, where somebody just explodes, they lose their grip on reality and control for a short moment because they see something terrible happen and they just have this reaction that is out of control in some sense. Now that doesn't make it justifiable, but it does make it less evil, if you will, because it doesn't involve the same mental processes that go into purpose. We see this purpose or premeditation in the Alex Murdaugh trial that's currently going on. The allegation in this trial is that Alex Murdaugh intentionally decided to kill his wife and child. When you're talking about negligence or recklessness in the criminal context, usually the person's mental state is such that they're not intending the result. And so because of that, you don't need to get into why they did what they did. But when you are talking about purpose, you do have this higher mental requirement that you have to show. That brings us to the second point, And that is when you're talking about criminal actions, even when you have to establish a mens rea, motive is technically irrelevant. The best way to show that using Alex Murdaugh as an example, is to show what the prosecution needs to prove in order to get a conviction in this case. We can do that by looking at the indictment. So here you can see in this indictment, talking about Alex Murdaugh's wife, that the grand jury found that Murdaugh fatally shot his wife. And you can see that they said that he did it with malice aforethought. And you can see looking at the indictment for his son's murder, they found the same thing, that he acted with malice aforethought. Now in both of these indictments, you can see that he's being charged with a violation of South Carolina Code 16.3.10. When you look at Code 16.3.10, you'll see that it defines murder as the killing of any person with malice aforethought, either express or implied. A forethought means that you've thought about or planned in advance the action that you're going to take. And malice can mean lots of different things in the law, but essentially it's going to be here, it's unjustified. And it's going to be in the sense that you are acting in a manner that is unlawful. And here it happens to be in the context of murder and it was planned out beforehand. So if you notice just by reading what this particular code says, it doesn't say anything about motive. And so the prosecutor needs to show that there was malice of forethought, and of course needs to show that there was an actual murder, but the prosecutor doesn't need to show why. The prosecutor doesn't need to say it was done for financial benefits. It was done because he was, he felt duped or something like that. And the forethought doesn't require this massive elaborative plot. You don't have to be like Ocean's Eleven where you see all the planning that goes into it. It's something that could happen with just a few seconds of planning that, and the result is 
is planned in advance of the act. So based on the code section in question, it doesn't say anything about why. There's no question about showing that, that Alex Murdoch did this perhaps for financial reasons, that he was trying to be viewed sympathetically by uh, prosecutors or others. Um, there's none of that. He's not doing it for revenge or to keep a witness quiet or anything. And that's not something that needs to be proven. And that's why motivation is irrelevant. And that's what talking heads mean when they say that. But this brings me to my third point. And although motive is legally irrelevant, it's factually very important for a jury. Here, a, the jury in the Alex Murdoch case has a clear set of facts under, on the one hand, that clearly two murders happened. When they're trying to figure out, based on circumstantial evidence, who pulled the triggers, they have to try to figure out who would want these two people dead. And that's where things get really murky because the evidence seems to suggest that Alex Murdoch had a great relationship with his wife, that he had a great relationship with his son. And if you notice, in the, if you happen to watch the opening statement by the defense in this case, they seized on that and they made that the main point of their defense to say, listen, there's no reason why this man would kill his wife and his son. There's just no reason for it. It makes no sense. In fact, he had just been having fun with them. He had been having a great time with them. And, and in the years before that, the decades before that, he'd been a loving husband, a loving father. Um, his son was the apple of his eye. Uh, there's just no reason for that to happen. It's not like he's facing financial hardship and there is there are massive life insurance policies that he'll be able to cash out if they're dead. The jury may say, even though all of the circumstantial evidence seems to point to him as the person who pulled the trigger, why would he do it? It doesn't make any sense. And because of that, some jurors may say that there's a reasonable doubt because it doesn't make any sense that he would do this, at least with malice aforethought. They may say he stood to gain nothing from their deaths. And if he had nothing to gain from it, why would he risk everything to kill them. That doesn't make sense. And even if he had, maybe he snapped, but if he snapped, he didn't act with malice forethought. And so that's going to create a problem there for the prosecution if they say, well, he didn't have the mens rea necessary because there's no motivation for that. That's why you may have some holdout jurors who refuse to convict because they may say, it just doesn't make sense why he did this. And even though he may have done it, he didn't do it with purpose. He did it for reasons that were different and therefore it wasn't with malice of forethought and therefore I cannot convict. So I hope this shed some light on how malice works in the legal context, why you hear about it in some cases, why you don't hear about it in others. It all really comes back to what mens rea is relevant. So let's continue to see how this plays out. I'm curious what the defense will do in the closing statements if they continue to really focus on the motive issue. And I'll be even more curious to see what the jury does with it. So thanks for watching. Um, if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing. Please consider liking the video and let me know your questions and your thoughts. And please stay tuned for more. Thanks.